All right. And so welcome everyone to our final Spring Bloom webinar. I hope you all have had a chance to enjoy some of our other webinars or activities. Um, my name is Sasha Codet. I'm one of the planners in the SAWS Conservation Department. And um, I'm, I'm a big gardener and I'm really <laughs> excited. It's, you know, I'm starting to see some signs of spring here. My mealy blue sage and my wine cups um, have some leaves starting to come up out of the ground. And I see leaves also appearing on my salvias. So I, I'm really excited about that. But I know I have some questions and concerns about freeze damage, and I'm sure many of you do as well. So we have some great experts here to help you with your questions. We have Mark Peterson, who is one of our project coordinators and our garden geek, <laughs> as well as two of our conservation consultants, Gail Gallegos and Brad Weir. So I am going to go ahead and turn this over to Mark. Well, thank you, Sasha. And uh, on behalf of the entire team conservation, we thank you for uh, all your watching. Uh, we had a lot of people watching, not only saw staff, but our partners, and they produced a lot of excellent programs. And I, I've been watching uh, most of those uh, over the, the week, and they were incredible. So I hope that you also watch those. Remember a little bit of housekeeping here. Um, remember, sign up for rewards. And then after the program, complete the survey. I have the locations there. Uh, if you are not a rewards member, please sign up for that. And that's at GardenStyleSanAntonio.com. And then also the survey, once you once you've uh, watched the program, complete the survey for points and prizes. So today's topics, we're gonna to talk a little bit about freeze damage, its effect on wildlife, its effect on irrigation, and those questions, anything that you are interested in. We're not just limiting, limiting it to freeze damage, but uh, give us anything that you would like to know about your landscaping and water conservation. Remember, we are water conservation at SAWS. So as Sasha reminded us, um, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A, not necessarily the chat, but the Q&A, and uh, we will uh, ask a few questions here uh, to uh, my coworkers, and then we will look to see where your, uh, what your questions are. Uh, and then this is a big round table. It's open format. We're not going to hit any specific topics, but we want you to participate on that. So uh, uh, I asked uh, uh, Brad and Gail to provide me with some questions and then also based on what I've been listening to uh, the last couple of days. And one of the questions that everybody's been asking me is, what about my palm? Frankly. It depends on the type of palm. If it was one of the feather palms or a Mexican fan palm or a sago palm, uh, sagos are not really palms or they're cycads, but in effect is uh, the chances are that it probably did not make it. Um, so then the follow-up question is, how long should I keep it up? Well, we've been telling everybody to uh, don't do anything until April 15th or, or May 1st, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, if there's no green coming out by the 1st of May, you may have to take it down. Uh, luckily, palms are pretty strong and uh, they don't need to be taken down right off. Uh, the main worry about dead palms is their fronds coming off in a good wind and striking somebody down below. The what we call the filifera, Washingtoni filifera, and you can identify those. That's a fan palm with a, a, a thick trunk. Uh, those appear to have done pretty well, but the sayballs, and Brad's always reminded me about the sayballs. The sayballs, uh, and those are fan palms without any teeth, uh, the rachis. Uh, they are. Uh, they survived very, very well. In fact, if you go to uh, down to Texas A&M University, San Antonio, 
in some of the parking lots, you'll see uh, these native Texas Sayballs, Sayball Minor Palmettos, like at Palmetto State Park. Uh, they were green, 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 green mm -hmm. during the historic freeze, and they are on phase. So uh, we have the Mexican Sayball and then the Carolina Sayball, Carolina or Florida Sayball. Uh, Brad. Um, I, I did have one question for you. Okay. People, people do have trouble telling their palms apart, but thank yeah. you for pointing that out about the sables. But they, uh, the Washington palms, yeah, those are the ones at Alamo Stadium. Those are the ones that are going to do fine. Yes. Those big, thick ones. Or, or another location is along Woodlawn. They tend to be the big, the big, thick trunks that are along Woodlawn Avenue. Uh, but Alamo Stadium is is a classic area. But you'll be able to see it's tall, skinny. Uh, and unfortunately, lots of them, they have their fronds down to the ground. Um, those are the Mexican fan palm. And unfortunately, back in 1989, there were a lot of those that had died. Um, those are the very tall ones, like Los Angeles, right? Very tall. Yes, <laughs> their, their, their scientific name is Washingtonia robusta, which is ironic and humorous. Uh, they are not very <laughs> robust, but they tend. A lot of people plant them because they are one of the faster growing palms. So uh, a lot of people like them uh, because of that, and they do sway in the wind and and look very lovely. Uh, but unfortunately, they do not tolerate uh, freezes very well. But anyway, I was going to ask you, Brad. Um, a lot of people were asking me about succulents, and I know you know a little bit about succulents. Uh, what do you think about the status of succulents? Uh, the two big, the two big groups of succulents that I'm going to talk about are the, are succulents are those fleshy plants like cactus is a succulent, prickly pear, um, and uh, these are the classic, uh, you know, the classic southwestern plants, and they're looking really bad right now. Even prickly pears look like they've melted, um, and that's because they're so full of those pads are so full of water that water froze, and so they've had tissue damage throughout. Um, I expect that big cactus-like plants, especially prickly pears, will be able to come back from the roots like they usually do. Um, but for others, like the agaves, um, the, the agaves are the big century plants, um, and uh, they've, they've been very damaged. Some of them are more cold tolerant, uh, but a lot of those plants are going to have to come back from the roots when they've had that kind of tissue damage. And that's going to require just patience, and it will depend how much you're in love with cactus and agaves, <laughs> how much patience <laughs> you find that you have. Agaves will always have pups coming up from the ground all around them um, every year, and usually you take them out. But this year, you may be choosing to save a few. Um, so you can, you can save those and then pot them up and plant them in another location. Yeah, Is that right. Okay, and you'll and Excellent. you'll find even even on the huge melted. Uh, on the huge melted agaves, uh, the uh, the agaves themselves plus the snow may have insulated some of those pups. Oh, excellent, excellent. Uh, for the the other succulents that people love uh, that took extensive damage are the sedums. Um, and if you're thinking of ghost plants, these are these are those tiny little adorable succulents. Uh, you'll see them at the front door of the uh, botanical gardens. Um, and they were just so small and so and so destroyed um, that some of those I expect um, you're going to be replacing. And the thing about many of those little sedums is uh, those who love them tend to replace them often anyway. Um, I've heard that growers do have sedums. They were able to protect them in greenhouses. But some of those tiny sedums uh, you may be replacing. So how long should we wait before we make a decision? on uh, our succulents uh, before removal or or continuating all of them are warm season plants they start growing late uh so you're going to be waiting until may 1st at least for them to even start growing on their usual cycle uh, so what should you do about the frozen fronds uh the leaves if that no, is a question i'm leaves. getting what the Melted leaves. The melted leaves, yeah. So that's the question I'm getting on the Garden Geek and on the phone is what to do about these frozen tissue. Uh, 
I expect that the tissue, the frozen tissue is not going to come back. So you have two choices. <laughs> uh, one of one of which is it's only the beginning of March and we could still have another freeze. It'll be 40 degrees this Friday. Uh, the longer you, if you can stand to wait a little bit, uh, it won't hurt you this year. Uh, but uh, how long should you wait? I, I think by uh, before before you remove that, I think. So you'll be April 15th. Is, is okay, what I'm so uh, Mark, everyone you, out there, uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, so, everyone out there, we're using kind of April 15th or March, or, or I'm sorry, May 5th, May 1st as our kind of like deadlines. So uh, just put that in the back of your mind. Uh, April 1st, April 15th, May 1st. And it is true that the gonna... removal of those agaves when they're melted like that, which happens every few years, uh, that you can burn yourself on the uh, on the tissues, which are full of some some chemicals um, that can cause contact dermatitis. And um, so do in some cases, a more serious allergic reaction. My husband had that almost an anaphylactic shock with the juices. So be careful. Oh, well, there you go. I think everyone should uh, remember that. Now, I wasn't aware of that. Thanks, Brad and Gail on that. Uh, That'd be a great Perot mystery. Uh, <laughs> uh, agave, death by agave. Uh, that's great. Uh, Gail, um, we are team conservation and we talk about water usage all the time. And a lot of people have irrigation systems. I know we've experienced what to what have you and the other consultants experienced out in the field with respect to the freeze and irrigation? Well, immediately after the freeze, the entire conservation team went into emergency mode of just trying to help people with all the frozen pipes that had burst primarily going into their house or somewhere in their house, in the garage, et cetera. So now that it's finally warming up and not raining that much, as the garden geek knows, he has recommended watering for the first time. When people go to turn their systems on, they're probably going to find, depending on where they live and what kind of soil and how cold it got, a lot of um, a lot of repairs might be needed. I just visited someone in Stone Oak that looked like they had a waterfall coming down their tiered <laughs> landscape, and that was only one of 12 leaks that he had. Um, yeah, I think uh, irrigation consult is going to be in order for a lot of people uh, that you can do through our garden style. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. No, no, I was going to go, uh, and and how does one? Yes. How does a customer uh, schedule a consult? You can call our admin team, which are superstars at answering questions and scheduling an irrigation consult for free with one of our six consult consultants at 210-704-SAVE, which is also 704-7283. And we will come out and we will check your irrigation system. And unlike a licensed irrigator, we will not charge you anything for telling you the things that might be wrong. We will also give you some great advice on how long you need to water each different zone in your area and also unlike irrigation or irrigators we we don't make repairs you're going to have to hire an irrigator to to make a repair but you know we'll also give you some tips on on saving some water and maybe making some irrigation changes that'll help not only make your water bill lower but your your yard more beautiful but yeah the freeze affected not only the pipes inside your house, but definitely the pipes in the ground. So give us a call. And then the other thing is that a lot of people don't put the batteries or don't check the batteries in their irrigation controller. So a good number of them that we've been going out to check are kind of flashing 2013, January 1st. And they'll go back to factory standards, which may be watering three times a week or at times that you just don't want that to be watering. So it's another thing to give us a call and have us check on. That's exactly right. Uh, a lot of these controllers were made in uh, Nevada or Colorado, uh, not Colorado, California. And so their settings, their factory settings are set for those areas. Now we don't recommend that, nor are we uh, current or, or allowed to do that because currently we are in stage one watering rules. So that's one day a week. So uh, we tell people, 
change those batteries every so often. And guess what? It's spring ahead this weekend. So like your fire alarms, uh, your smoke detectors, uh, put your battery in into the uh, uh, controller. And so uh, that would that would definitely help. Pick a time of year. All right, this is kind of a question for everybody. Um, does anyone, has anyone heard of uh, magic uh, formulas, uh, magic juice, uh, fertilizer, compost, or anything else in the world that could actually help plants which are frozen and uh, unfreeze them or make them better? <laughs> Well, there's this special anti-freeze <laughs> dance that you do at the stroke of midnight in your backyard around said plant. No, no. actually, no, no, I would no, just no. Say... Gail, Gail has seen me dance, and that's not something anyone would like to see. <laughs> What's up? I mean, there is. It's a. Uh, it, it takes until April before plants will start taking up fertilizer usually. Uh, so there's nothing you can put on <clears throat> during a freeze that's going to help, other than a blanket. Um, or a heat lamp, and heat lamps didn't work this year because we didn't have electricity. Yes. That said, it's March, um, and this is the time of year when usually uh, you feel like you want to do something good for your, especially for your grass. Um, the best fertilizer you can put at this time of year, this is the time of year when you can put down um, a third or a half an inch of compost over your grass. And it's uh, it has a lot of nutrients in it that act like a fertilizer, but it also rebuilds the uh, the eroded soil to give you deeper soil under the grass, which it appreciates. And so this, this March is the time of year before it gets hot when it's good to apply compost. Uh, and again, for everyone, they can go to our uh, uh, Garden Style San Antonio and click on uh, resources, garden resources, and they'll see a maintenance schedule on there. And now if you click on March, you'll see uh, applying compost to the lawn and to the beds. And then again, we recommend it in November. So early March or, or early spring. And late fall is the time when we put compost down. Uh, for mulch, we put it down in May and September. So excellent idea on that. But hey, if you have some other questions on what to do for maintenance in your landscape, please go to gardenstylesa.com and go to the resources, garden resources. Mm -hmm. uh, I hate to ask us, uh, uh, Sasha, do we have any questions? We have lots of great questions. Lots. Oh, excellent. Up. Okay, good. Let's go there. Yeah, and I think some folks may have missed the beginning. Um, so I'm going to just ask them. Um, we may have a little bit of repeat information mm -hmm. in here. So just have a little patience with us. Actually, our first question is, will core aerating my lawn this year be too stressful? On it with heavy machine damaging the roots. Okay to add a quarter inch of compost after aerating. Yes and yes. No, I, I'm sorry. Uh, no, it won't. It won't affect the roots. But yes, like core aeration, uh, and that's core aeration, which actually removes the little plugs, uh, and then a compost on top. Let me so, ask you, Mark. Uh, I mean, were grasses was was turf grass damaged by this event? N not really. Not, 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 no, the tops were burned on certain grasses. Uh, now, St. Augustine, which is actually a, a Caribbean and West Africa marsh grass, um, that was affected a little bit. But um, generally, it bounces right back when it's a little bit warmer. Uh, so um, uh, the tops were burned a little bit, but that's okay. Uh, not, not a problem. They'll come right back. All right, our next question is Gin ginger and philodendron were all hit hard. All the leaves are mushy or blonde. What are the chances for a revival? Hmm. Uh, those are two interesting plants that you've chosen. And uh, and I we can add cannas in there as well. And, uh, yes. and, and spider yeah. plants or spider lilies. Yeah, I saw a group there. Of the, of that group, I mean, because those plants regularly freeze to the ground in every year anyway, I don't expect a lot of root damage to happen to most of them. 
Mm-hmm. Um, with the exception of split leaf philodendron, which is a Brazilian plant <laughs> that just is not used to ever losing its leaves. Um, and I, I find that split leaf philodendron does not recover well from cold damage. But at the same yeah. time, I think that cannas will bounce back. Um, spider lilies bounce back every year. Um, and gingers, I expect them to bounce back. I mean, at the botanical gardens, they cut them to the ground anyway every year, so they lose their leaves every year. Um, what do my, you think, Mark? My spider lily is already coming back uh-huh. and yeah. showing growth. Right. In fact, that... outside this window, there are spider lilies bouncing yeah. back now. <laughs> and, and, and for everyone, yeah, I really love spider lilies. They're uh, for shady uh, or shady and foundation uh, plants uh, because of that. Yes. They freeze, they turn to mush, and within a matter of 10 to 14 days, they're back growing up again. So uh, I find them really, really good. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, uh, Gingers, uh, spider lilies, anything that's leafy, uh, strap-like leaves is, uh, it will depend on its native background. So, Split I have a, I have a oh, question no, on that note, yeah. uh, Mark. Do you think that older, more mature ones will do better than the younger ones? Yeah, and that's where just where I was going is uh, maybe the more exposed, like an older one with a big trunk. Um, I think it may have been more exposed. Uh, so the younger ones with more of the roots in the ground probably will come back, okay. or more likely. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is an interesting event, and we need to watch and wait, as my the bywords of everyone out there, but not only Bob Webster, or David Rodriguez, myself, or or the doctors. Um, you know, we're all out there, and we're going. Let's watch and wait. Uh, so basically, we, we don't need have a lot of experience. Patience yeah. and plant prayers. That's it. <laughs> we need yes. more of both patience yes. and plant yeah. prayers. Yeah. It is funny, Gail. Uh, patience is one of the hardest things to apply to your landscape. It's very hard. Um, Particularly right now when it's warming up and enthusiastic gardeners would love to be outside and uh, working with the dirt in the dirt or the soil properly, but dirt for most of us. Uh, and it's just so hard, just so hard. All right, great. So we have another question. Um, I have a blood orange tree that has been in the ground for 10 years. The leaves are all brown now and still on the tree. What should I do to help it survive? As Gail said, uh, prayers. Prayers, I think, are most important on that. Uh, Citrus, uh, it depends on the citrus. This is one of the questions I put down is mm-hmm. also which citrus is most cold tolerant. And that would be uh, the satsumas on uh, on their own rootstock like Arctic frost or orange frost, Mr. Moy's hybrids. Right. Tangerines. And yeah, it's so, so there's tangerine is the most cold hardy and uh, Mr. Moy's uh, hybrids and involves Satsuma, Mandarins, and Tangerines crossing the two. When we get to lemons, limes, grapefruits, uh, it's a little bit more touchy, touch and go. Um, We have to use those words again. Let's be patient. Let's see. Uh, Probably what's going to happen is the plant has frozen back, and we hopefully will say that it won't it, it won't have frozen back all the way, and we can prune it. Otherwise, it has a really good rootstock down below, and it will sprout back up. And that's that's our hope. That's our hope and prayer that it will just rebound. Now, uh, the one caveat I could see it already in Brad's eyes. The one caveat on citrus is if it's grafted. And the scion uh, dies. It may all of a sudden there may be these full shoots coming right out, very fast, very green, very thorny. And that will be the original rootstock. That's uh, sour orange, and you will never get any any good good fruit off of that. So if if the sprouts off the base of the of the roots 
are very green and thorny, and we're talking good one inch or longer thorns, then uh, it's time to get a new one. And that, uh, but there's nothing we can put on, uh, nothing that we can add that's going to improve uh, its health and growth. Not until it starts growing again, then we can add a little bit of organic fertilizer. But we don't like to put any fertilizer on stressed trees. Compost is the best thing. Mark, you said that if, it, if, you, <laughs> if, if you have to take it out, if it's dead, you have to take it out. We have a question that is asking how to remove it. What's the best way? Uh, for the entire plant? Yeah, yes. Nice mm -hmm. sharp shovel. Oh, sharp a sharp shooter? Sharp <laughs> shooter. Well, sharp shovel. Uh, yeah, or sharp shooter. Um, on the sharpshooter, you can really fling it hard. Uh, with a sharp shovel, you have to use your feet on it. But, uh, it'll it'll depend and, what the plant is. Yeah. Uh, I I wonder if that question was about cactus. So, do you have to dig up the roots on cactus? I don't think so. Yeah, they're very shallow, but it's nice with a sharpshooter. You can like pop them right out. Okay. Um, generally for all plants, is there a rule of thumb for knowing if the plant will survive? Uh, I, I have a trick that I, that I've been using a lot <laughs> this week. Um, and it works, it, but it does not work on all plants. Uh, but if you've got branches, if you've got something resembling wood, you can always just take your fingernail and scrape a branch, just a little piece. Uh, and you could just you're just peeling back a little of the bark on a branch and you will see you will either see green tissue underneath in which in which that branch is conducting water it's still alive and green and uh it's still performing its purpose and it's alive however on some of the plants i'm seeing uh some uh, mexican plants and some tropical plants uh there's there's no green tissue under there it's black and it's clearly the, it's dried out and black. It's not conducting water, and it's damaged or dead. Uh, but you can t you can easily tell if it's alive or dead uh, if it's got some branches. This does not work for palms unless you're really good at climbing. <laughs> the most important part of the uh, uh, palm is the very, very, very top. What we call the, the palm heart is actually, that's the very top. And that's where the growing point is. Um, I've seen black tissue this week on grapefruits and uh, Mexican ebony's. Uh, yeah, we, you and I were talking about Mexican ebony, uh, also Mexican olive. Um, fortunately, fortunately, I found green tissue uh, about a foot, foot and a half off the ground, and so, but everything else is dead. But that's very. Very, very heartening is that I'm finding it on the lower parts of the tree. Of the Mexican olives. The Mexican uh, olives. There was that so, classic Mexican olive at the Alamo for all the I was just going to say, you and I have been talking <laughs> about the Mexican olive at the Alamo for a while now. And uh, it, uh, it froze and regrew, froze and regrew, froze again and regrew. Um, I said I was going to go down to check it, so I don't know. Uh, I haven't this week, so uh, I, hopefully it has. It will be regrowing again. Uh, that one's gone. They they actually removed that tree. I th I think it was digging into the Alamo Foundation, so we can't use that example anymore. Oh, but Mexican okay. olive is the classic tree that, uh, even when the top is frozen off, uh, can be cut to the ground and will re regrow from the ground. It's got a big root that survived, and so it'll grow fast. Uh, there's a lot of trees that are going to be in that same situation this year. All right, just a quick reminder to folks, please put your questions in the Q&A box. It should be the bottom right, three little dots, click it and you can drop it in there. All right, we have a question here. A Turk's cap in my central city yard needs to be reined in, but the roots are so entangled in my heavy clay soil, a fork can't get through. Any suggestions for another tool? Um. Oh, oh. You know what I like to do with turf cap, so go ahead, Brad. <laughs> so, 
Oh well, Mark. Mark likes. Uh, you can cut a Turk's cap to the ground without mm -hmm. hurting it. And absolutely, fact, <laughs> my favorite wep uh, we weapon tool is a head shears. Mm -hmm. uh, and I like to cut it back right now, this time of year, right down to three inches above the ground. And then again, lightly, about 25% around around uh, 4th of July. And then maybe again, Labor Day, right? We, we You and I discuss this all the time. Mm -hmm. is, uh, do we do a third one? Uh, and I think uh, we kind of decided, at, like at Botanical Gardens, uh, our experience at Botanical Gardens is maybe just a light one. Again, a light one. But uh, Turk's cap and other perennials respond, some other re perennials respond well to cutting, to pruning. Uh, to keep that uh, dense shape that we like. Uh, I, I, think this, I think this event wasn't that bad for perennials because a lot of them are frozen in winter anyway. And so mm -hmm. they're growing, they're, they're already busting back from the roots on their own. I haven't seen a Turk's cap with leaves uh, more than three inches from the ground yet. So this is a good time to cut Turk's cap. Well, if it's three inches above the ground, I don't have to worry about it. But you just got to cut all that dead material. Mm -hmm. um, while we are talking about pruning off um, leaves and things, um, I do want to um, ask this question again in case some folks missed it. I see a lot of these in here again. Uh, please let us know um, the sago palms are green close to the trunk. Should the brown leaves be trimmed off? You said the brown leaves can be pruned off, Brad? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. brown leaves can be pruned off, but you know, it is kind of pretty with that color brown uh, and the nice sunset coming through with that brown leaves. But you you can cut off the brown <laughs> leaves now. We just have to, <laughs> we just have to wait again to determine if it's if you're going to need to remove the entire stalk because uh sago palms are not palms they are cycads but they are similar in physiology so we just have to wait the growing part the true growing part of the sago is the very very top here's uh, an advantage with the sago palm they do produce pups they're called pups on the base and you may get some pups this year uh, if you do, then you can remove those with a sharp knife or machete, careful with the machete, uh, and then regrow those, put some uh, rooting hormone on them and grow them in pots and then regrow them. You've been floating around a number. Uh, you think some sagos aren't coming back, right, Mark? Yeah. Uh, you had um, a good so, percentage. <laughs> so yeah, so Calvin, Dr. Kelmer Finch and, uh, has been using 50% and I'm a little bit more negative. Uh, I don't think, uh, I think only 40%, uh, that is 60% of the sagos around town will die and ha will have to be removed. Um, that's probably higher than that, but you never know. These are biological plants. They're alive and they will always fool you. <laughs> so I, I use 60% probably are gone. All right, let's move along to this question about um, about veggies. So I just bought some vegetable plants, tomatoes, bell peppers, cucumbers will be a good time to plant now in planters as my raised bed isn't ready to use yet. Brad, you shocked me with your weather forecast. Tell me more about this. <laughs> but wait, 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 I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I, I, I was reading, um, what, what was the question again? So. Um, the, the question is whether to um, plant vegetables like tomatoes, bell peppers, cucumbers now in planters instead of in um, raised beds as the bed's not quite ready. Uh, well, I, I, I think a planter and a raised bed are basically, they're comparable, Same. they're both above yeah. ground. Yeah. Um, and if you uh, it'll depend. It. it is it is early. It is early. Yeah. So um, uh, you mentioned bell peppers, and I think it's too early to do. It may be. It is barely time to plant bell peppers. Bell peppers uh, should be planted in May. Okay. Yeah. So uh, um, tomatoes. Yeah, it's a little early. Um, if you do to if you do do tomatoes, 
uh, make sure that they have a large cage and that they are surrounded by some of that thinsulate or insulate. And uh, the main reason on that is cold winds uh, are really harmful for tomato plants. And so, and we tend to get those at this time of year. So you want to protect them against the cold wind. Um, so if you do put them in, uh, whether it be a container or a bed, uh, protect them against the wind. Um, but as for the difference between pots, between pots and uh, and raised beds, it's basically similar. As, as they need to be big pots if you want those vegetables be, to be big. <laughs> And I would say too that the AgriLife Extension Service and Bear County Master Gardeners have a lot of wonderful uh, vegetable gardening resources. Um, so you might want to check their website. I know they have like a calendar of when to plant things and lots of great recommendations. I use it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, so let's see. Have we talked about Asiatic jasmine yet? Prune or remove? Well, uh, I was going to ask Brad that. It's one of my questions uh, for Brad. So I'm glad that was asked. Uh, it seems to have taken a hit in certain areas, the Asiatic jasmine. Uh, so uh, I don't think its roots were affected, but uh, Brad, Gail, what do you think about the Asiatic jasmine? I, I don't think the roots would have been affected. Uh, and this is the time of year when a lot of people will actually mow Asiatic jasmine down to six inches or four inches. Uh, so it's a good time of year to cut it, uh, but it may not all come back if, if the roots were damaged. It may take it a uh, while to come back. This is what I'm saying. I, so I agree slow. with you. <laughs> yes, I'm saying slowly. Everything is going to take a while to recover. I agree completely that I don't think that the most of these plants' roots are not damaged. A lot of the top stuff, the leaves, etc., got damaged. And so it's the time to prune it back. If you can wait a little while, that would be great because Mark has seen cold on our horizon that Brad, that Mark, I mean, Brad has seen cold on our horizon yes. that Mark and I had not known about. So if you could just wait a little bit longer, but maybe, you know, after two weeks, go ahead and trim off what's dead and, and have patience because just if, like, if you were hurt by something, it takes a little while for it to come back. It's not just springing back in spring. And my opinion is uh, pruning. Turning back, cutting back, yeah, good start. Very good start with Asiac Jasmine. Uh, I think it should be cut back once a year, and this is a proper time to do it. Anyway. There has been a question that I've been looking at on the screen. Asiac Jasmine is usually planted under oaks where it's too dark to grow grass. Um, and there's a, a question that came in on the chat, um, whether oaks have dropped their leaves early because of the freeze. Um, and right on time. So. That's right on time. It should be somewhere around uh, mid March fifteenth, uh, and it's the thirteenth. Thirteenth, and so it's right about right on time. It may be a couple of days early, but it depends on the genetics of the live oak. And you can see on a hillside in the hill country right now, uh, certain families of live oaks, they will all drop their leaves within a two day period. And then trees, uh, which are from a different genotype right next door are totally green and then they'll lose their leaves next next week or sometime. So uh, maybe a couple of days, but pretty much right on time for the live oaks. Tell me Mark, uh, as it's March 13th, uh... Is it too late to do pruning on live oaks? Uh, the springtime of the year is the worst time to prune any tree uh, for various reasons. And we can get into all the different reasons. Uh, our friend Lee it gave us uh, another reason why not to do it uh, yesterday in her program. But spring is generally the, the, the not really great time to prune trees. Specifically for live oaks, it's not. Uh, because of their susceptibility and the availability of spores of live oak, of oak wilt. Um, the, at this time of year, the trees are most susceptible. There's the most amount of fungal spores and the, the insect vectors that transmit those spores are all at their highest. So this is a no-no time for pruning live oak. 
thank you because you know I, I just spent 36 years uh, talking about oak weld so <laughs> it always it always gets me going a little passion um so. Here we have a question about rosemaries. I know that's a pretty common plant around in our landscape here. So my younger prostrate rosemaries still have green at the bottom, but the top is gray. Should I pull them out and replace or try and trim old ones deader than a doornail? Hmm. So I, I had an answer to that one. Uh, <laughs> deader than a doornail, take it out. Um, the ones that are the dead at the top, green at the base, go ahead and trim those. And if you can, wait a little bit longer because you know they may help insulate if we do get any more cold. So maybe around April 1st, if everything's still going good with the base, just trim off the dead little tops. And dead as a doornail, take it out. Put it in your compost. See, I, I, I recommend for any rosemary that every three to five years, you're going to cut it back anyway. And so, oh, this is a good time. Start year zero. Um, go ahead and do it. And then uh, just think uh, 2026, you're going to cut it back anyway. Rosemary is one of those plants that we uh, think of as being evergreen. And the idea that it was hurt in, a, <clears throat> in cold is unthinkable in our climate. But mm -hmm. um, I always tell people if rosemary dies, uh, and if you like rosemary, just replace it with uh, rosemary because it grows fast. Um, it may have to be replaced every few years. And this is one of those years. Okay, thanks, Brad. Okay, so um, we have another prickly pear question here. I'm noticing that there seems to be a big difference in prickly pear survival. Some shrugged off the freeze and others melted. Even some with no spines did great. The mm -hmm. pretty purple pads seem gone. Maybe I need to ask the neighbors with the strong ones to donate a pad to start my own. Yeah, we, we, we this was a great question because Brad and I were like uh, talking about it. And what did you find, Brad? You found, didn't you find that one survived among others? It's a, incredibly, the spineless prickly pears, uh, the thick spineless ones did well. Um, it didn't melt. I don't know if they have thicker skins, apparently. Um, you would expect the purple ones would also do well because they're from West Texas, from Big Bend, where it's it gets colder than it does here at the top of the mountains. Those, uh, If you know the purple ones I'm talking about. Um, the, the, the pads are slightly purple. Yeah. yeah the purple coloration on that. Uh, uh, so the answer is yes, that's right. Your observation is correct. Some prickly pear did better than others. Uh, and for what reason? We don't know. Um, maybe physiological, maybe dislocations that we don't know. But if you're looking to replace a prickly pear, you're correct. That's it's it's very easy to do. Just take a pad, um, put it in a pot, water it for a, a month till it grows some roots, and then just plant it in the ground. Brad, do you need to let it cure for a little while once you break the pad off? Do, doesn't it need to dry out a little bit? First? Oh, to be able to make roots? Yes. So, you don't want you, it to get you, mushy. You, what's that? So, or or it, root hormone. In the pot or, or leave it out of the pot for a few days? So. I would leave it out of the pot for a few days and then just barely have that, that part where it's broken off kind of making contact with the soil, not a deep planting. Okay, great. We have a question here about um, sago palms and fertilizing them. Uh, since their sago palms got frozen and pruned completely all the yellow leaves, would you recommend applying a palm fertilizer to help them recover? And if so, would you suggest to do it now or wait until, um, or when to, when to apply it? <laughs> palms are never fertilized until May anyway. So the first time, and, and then two, we hardly ever, 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 ever fertilize a stressed plant. So uh, I would, I would wait uh, towards maybe towards Memorial Day before I would ever put any kind of palm for, and that's good. Palm for there, uh, palms require uh, specific types of fertilizer, which is low in nitrogen higher in some of the micronutrients. So that's good, but I would wait until May at the earliest. And there's a question, they knew that, you know, we recommended the compost 
on grass now, but when is the best time to fertilize, which is not now? Neither uh, grass, nor trees, nor palms, or anything is not fertilized until the end of April at the earliest. If you're using standard fertilization, you may go right now with a slow release, but I wouldn't recommend it. I would even wait on the slow release until until April sometime. I don't, uh, certainly not palms, certainly not trees, not until May. And I'm just going to jump back really quickly to where we were discussing um, the agaves and how you need to be really careful um, and wear gloves when you're handling them because they can um, irritate your skin. Um, and there was a question about aloes and um, whether you need to wear gloves on those. And then while we're talking about aloes, we've had a few questions about how they're doing and what you we should do with them after the freeze. I, I do My, think I, I want to remind us of the existence of the soap aloe, which can burn. <laughs> <laughs> that's the one that's uh, it's very cool. It's the one with the red flowers and very popular in landscaping. And that one does have some, I've, I've heard of people uh, reacting to that one badly. Um, uh, so you want to be careful with that one. For the but for the usual aloe, which is the uh, just the one you put on your sunburns, so and, yeah, uh, it's Rocha actually or, beneficial. Or something yeah. like that. <laughs> it should it should it should help your skin, Gail. Then I burn. Yeah, but, that, been through. So. yeah but but cactus and some agaves, uh, I, I would worry about a little bit. So I probably have an alkaloid in it. But what's the other part of the question? Also, what should you do with your aloes right now? After oh, the freeze? Uh, um, that's why I was shaking my head. Um, I would say there, a lot of the aloes uh, are no longer with us. Okay. Uh, there are, yeah, uh, uh, aloes tend to be from uh, the Caribbean or other places where it's very warm and never experience any freezes. And a lot of those uh, are not are not are no longer with us, and will not be. But again, there's always hope. Uh, some of them may have been just protected long enough to survive. Great. We have a question here about fig trees and whether uh, whether they will have survived. I yes. think trees are going to be fine. Any any fine. Anything that didn't have leaves on it, yeah. Yeah, any mortality is a good thing. So uh, for it, because if anybody has a fig, they will know that uh, if you do not prune on a regular basis, they will get away from you very quickly. And so it's that's probably a good thing to have some mortality on that. And uh, again, the tree will show you where to prune here shortly, within the next uh, 30 to 40 days. You'll know where to prune. Well, and related uh, I'm a question about xylosma right now, which has been a surprise casualty. Uh, yeah, uh, and we haven't, uh, we didn't know this. Now we do. Uh, yeah, Xylosma uh, really took it hard. Uh, we've been really promoting it over the last couple of decades, uh, but we didn't know how hard it was going to take the, the freeze. Um, so uh, I don't think anybody's provided any kind of uh, definitive percentages uh, on that, but yes, there was a lot of casualty with the Xylosma. Um, we think that they may have survived and rerun from the roots at the botanical yes. gardens after the 1989 yeah. freeze. Right. Uh, and uh, if anyone remembers 83 and the 89 freezes, uh, there was a dramatic change in uh, the, the plants recommended. Uh, prior to 83 and 89, uh, uh, Indian hawthorn, majestic beauty, was uh, hugely recommended. Uh, as well as viburnum tinus, and uh, they were both hit hard. 
Uh, then uh, Photinias, red tip Photinias were in strongly recommended and planted everywhere. And now we see a lot of problems with the red tip Photinias. So it's, it's interesting every, every couple of decades when there's a freeze, uh, there's a dramatic change in landscapes. Uh, Xylosma was our big change for Fotinias and uh, or replacements for for Fotinias, and now we see that there's a little freeze. But we're hoping, hoping as Brad said, that most of them will recover from the root stock. Okay, our next question here is um, about they're concerned about um, freezes coming up uh, potentially. Would you recommend waiting to uh, plant until in April? What would you suggest? Yeah. <laughs> so I, was on, I mean, I'm on the optimistic side and think that, you know, okay, that was the big freeze and we're not gonna have one. And then Brad comes and busts our bubble. So a, everything- That's is an overnight our, low of 40 yeah. degrees. Okay. <laughs> everything is is everything that's out there that's trying to make it is struggling right now anyway. So I would just go ahead since we're going to have a slower spring anyway for all the things that are already out there. I just wait wait at least two to four weeks before really starting up. Gives you time to plan. Gives you time uh, to pull out that grass. Gives yes. you time to just Kill start all grass. over. Kill the grass. And then, uh, um, like our previous programs, uh, kill the grass and then learn how to maintain it over the next two or three years. Um, so hopefully everyone watch those programs. And as, as Sasha said, in a few days, probably more like uh, a week, we'll have all those uh, up on our San Antonio GardenStyle.com uh, webpage with, uh, at, the, uh, at the videos. So go ahead and look at those. But this morning, Gail and I were talking about how to kill that nasty grass. And then Karen and Nathan were talking about uh, what to do during their early years, their toddler years. And and uh, hopefully. And they actually had a great suggestion in their presentation um, about waiting to purchase the plants until you have your holes ready to go um, and you're ready to plant them, that you don't want them sitting in pots for too long, right? Yeah, and that's what we heard uh, a lot of questions. People go, I didn't get a chance to put my plant in that I bought last year into the ground. It was in the pot and I was worried that it froze. And at this point in time, everyone can see my eyes rolling. Yes, always have your hole dug before you go to the nursery. Um, don't go to the nursery and buy plants and then just put them on the patio. Um, always have that hole dug because then you're gonna put it in the ground. Plant always likes to be in the ground. It is all interesting right. there. There was a big question. I, I think we're all feeling better about this now, but there was a question how the uh, freeze would have affected uh, growers and the plant selection at nurseries. But in March, uh, nurseries, <clears throat> they, they don't even have a lot of their summer plants yet. It's still too early in the year. They, they won't have those until April. Right. Uh, they, they've made the order, but it hasn't been delivered. Uh, this is kind of a transitional period. And so a lot of those wholesalers uh, don't have those plants. Uh, so there may be a, a delay. So this goes back to what Gail was saying, is I should wait two to four weeks. I would wait, yeah, same amount of time, probably about two to three weeks. Um, but uh, if you wait, then there may be some additional plants in the nurseries uh, as, they, as they suppliers come and move up a move and upgrade their, their potted plant or their four and a half inch plants to larger one, six inch and ones. Mark, can you touch real quickly on some of the woody type species as well as woody species that we're seeing the split in the wood after the freeze, whether it's a trunk yes. or, you know, other yes, parts mostly, of it? M mostly the citrus and other uh, subtropical or, uh, tropical plants on that. Not so much of the natives. Occasionally you'll see a young native, approximately two inches in diameter where their trunk was split. Uh, most of the time we don't worry about it if there is enough uh, cambium layer. And so the, I was gonna say, if, if it 
if it appears sunken, that's not a good sign. If it's round and there are certain strips al along the trunk, uh, longitudinal strips that are sunken in, that's a bad sign. Uh, and, but if it's round and split on the uh, on the bark, but there appears to be solidly round all the way around, then that's okay. So the question was about uh, Confederate jasmine, and then I actually did see a young mountain laurel. I think the mountain laurel is going to be on the okay side based on your description there, but even something like Confederate jasmine, which is much more of a vine, but you know how if it lives for several years, it gets to a, a the bottom of it is almost a woody base. Mm -hmm. And I, I would think that- What about trimming uh, that? That, that probably should be uh, pruned back. Okay. That uh, I, uh, again, it's, it's not a native to this area. So uh, it probably lost the upper portion. If it has been in the ground for a long period of time, it should come and bounce right back. But the upper portion is gone. Um, what about uh, another, another uh, un, not well-known citrus is actually Pittosporum. Um, and some of them have been seen also splitting, um, even the mature ones. That's very interesting because uh, uh, you and I remember back at the Botanical Gardens back in uh, 89, where there was a lot of Pittosporin lost in the Sacred Gardens uh, and the uh, Century Garden, Sensory Gardens. Um, and a lot of those, uh, the bigger ones, they may have lost large limbs, but they pretty much tolerated it. A lot of the dwarf ones actually, actually were like frozen right down the ground and didn't come back. But uh, if it was a large pittosporum, they may have lost branches and they probably will lose branches, uh, but they won't die all the way down to the ground. And if they did, surprisingly, if they did uh, die back, they have a, a tremendous root system and they can bounce right back. Okay. And again, I just follow that up to some of those who may be coming in a little later. Uh, we do not fertilize stressed plants. And if anybody was going to fertilize, then they're going to wait until May, latter part of April or May. Mark, can you, we have several questions about um, compost and fertilizer in here. So I do want to get you to um, recommend the months uh, that we would do that again. But also okay. we have a question about um, is there a slow release fertilizer that wouldn't be as um, stinky because <laughs> the dogs might be rolling in the compost and bringing it in the house? So when would you compost and fertilize and what would you recommend? All right, yeah, real quickly, um, we compost in March, early March, and again in early November, and we mulch in May and September. Uh, we core aerate. With the with the compost, organic fertilizers. Uh, there's a whole host. Um, I'm sure there are favorites out there. I have several favorites. I don't know if I should mention those favorites right now, but there's a bunch of uh, out there. Uh, of course, locally we have Medina products, and so I highly encourage anybody to use Medina products. But, it, but they can find a lot of that information, again, on our website at GardenStyleSA.com. <laughs> uh, if they go to Garden Resources, there's a maintenance section. That uh, was uh, written by uh, uh, Brad and I, uh, where you can find <laughs> up uh, everything you need to know what to do for the landscape uh, per month, per plant type, and per, per equipment. Or topic, topic, right to topic. Thank you. I'm yeah. seeing a question here. Um, <clears throat> I think it's for Gail, but uh, it's asking about, you were talking about mountain laurels and mountain laurels are dropping their leaves. So they've taken some damage. Um, and the question is, is uh, are they going to be okay? Yes. <laughs> What's a, they, so you're not going to get. Yes. So they are. They are my. They laugh 
I mean, yes, yeah, anything scoff, that's going to go through horrible drought is going to be affected. Anything that goes through 104 hours of really freezing temperature is going to be affected. But even the young ones that are running around the Salado Creek in nature are, are fine. Um, yes, they had damage. But overall, I mean, they froze their fingers and they'll be back. But luckily, they grow their fingers back. You're not going to see our wonderful bloom that we get every spring. Um, if you do see mountain laurel blooms, send us pictures because we're all yes. longing for it. Most of the blooms got frozen, but mountain laurels is one of the A-OK -okay top number one picks for this area, cold and hot. Well, with oh. that, we have quite a few questions that we were unable to get to, but it looks like we're about out of time here. So I'd really like to encourage everyone to go to our website, gardenstyleessay.com, and um, you can submit your questions to Mark, our garden geek, on there. If we didn't have a chance to get to your question yet, my apologies. Mark, um, would you like to wrap this up for us? I would. I think there's a lovely slide coming up. Uh, not that one. One yeah. more. Here we go. That's my slide. Okay. Uh, to everyone, uh, thank you again for participating in Spring Bloom 2021. Uh, this is our virtual one. And uh, I think it went really well. We had some excellent presentations by not only SAW staff, but our partners as well, our conservation partners. And we'd like to thank all of them. So, and we'd like to thank you for participating in this. Uh, remember to become a rewards member today. And that's uh, by midnight tonight. Uh, <laughs> and go to gardenstylesa.com to become eligible for spring bloom points and prizes. And where do you do that? You take the survey after this program. Sasha is actually gonna turn it on here shortly. Um, and you go to the spring bloom page by at go to saws.org forward slash spring bloom and it'll take you automatically to the landing page. And as Sasha mentioned, uh, if you have other questions, you may submit that to the garden geek at gardenstyleessay.com. Again, we thank you all. And on behalf of Brad and Gail, um, it's Mark Peterson. Oh, and Sasha, of course, uh, the host and producer. <laughs> our producer. Uh, yeah, uh, our Roz uh, from uh, Frazier. Uh, we thank you all. Uh, this is the last program, um, but I can't help thanking you all again for wonderful participation. Next year, we may be meeting again, or maybe there will be a hybrid similar to this. We haven't decided yet, but send us your comments on that. And then that's uh, probably the last thing I'll say. Thank you and goodbye. Thank goodbye. you. Bye. Thank you all.